by simply a duty to consult, if necessary, a list of, of consultees? Uh, yes, that's a start. Yeah, thank you. Right, uh, Angela Constance, please. Thank you, Convener. Professor Patterson, I wondered what evidence uh, there is that opening up the legal services market to uh, both banks and supermarkets and whether or not that will actually increase access to justice. Well, none of us know the answer to that question. We all have views on that question. The consumer movement has views on that question. SLAB has views on that question. The Law Society has views on that question. We have relatively little research evidence. That was a question somebody raised earlier. We've got relatively little research evidence on what, is, uh, what will happen. So we have a lot of uh, hypotheses about what might happen. Well, we know retail analysts have done a fair amount of research into what the impact of supermarkets are. And it's not all negative. That's why we all go and shop at supermarkets. But the question is, are supermarkets, uh, what would be the impact of supermarkets delivering legal services? Well, one of the things that they have, according to the analysts, done is to close down or lead to the close down of a number of high street um, butchers, bakers, and so on. Some niche markets have survived, but there are statistics and charts available that show you the decline of the high street provider. Now, if they are providing exactly the same or better at a, be a higher quality and a cheaper price, as they would say, then you can't really object to that. But it's not clear that that would necessarily happen with legal services because, although some have argued legal services are just like a can of beans, I'm not sure that they are exactly the same as a can of beans. And uh, therefore, one of the arguments is that... Um, uh, being very smart business persons, the uh, supermarkets will go to the areas of legal practice and legal services that they can make significant profits from, but might not be so attracted to deliver uh, the areas where there is less money to be made. Now, in rural areas, there isn't a huge amount of money to be made out of legal aid, even if you're very efficient. And if you're not very efficient, uh, then you're cross-subsidizing uh, in rural areas uh, legal aid. And my concern on that front is that uh, supermarkets, um, by choosing not to do legal aid, well, then they might do it, and there might be new providers, it has been suggested, and, and I believe some uh, who in this area feel that new providers will come in with these provisions which will, 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 which will uh, um, focus particularly on access to justice. But my concern with supermarkets is that I don't see that they will think there's enough financial incentive, certainly in the rural areas, to provide uh, legal, uh, legal aid. And I think that might lead either firms to go under or high street firms to go under or more likely high street uh, law firms not to do work that they regard as non-remunerative either. Do you have similar concerns about banks? I suppose I do. I think, I think uh, we're all a little less trusting of banks now than we were two years ago. Uh, you know, two years ago when we were having these debates, there was talk about light touch regulation. Down south, the hope was, law society hoped, we would have light touch regulation. And the model that Clementi adopted was the financial services model. Many people now think that that model has not worked particularly well and that what we need, as the government has said in this bill, uh, we need robust regulation. Thank you for that, Professor Patterson. Talking about regulation, um, you began earlier, you touched upon the regulation of multidisciplinary practices. Um, does the bill, in your view, provide a satisfactory framework to deal with the divergence and differences between respect of professional standards and codes of conduct? Well, as my written evidence suggests, I don't think that. Um, it has been, at least 
to my mind, one of the clearest issues uh, to do with alternative business structures about how do you deal with the fact that the uh, professional providers and indeed the non-professional providers um, will have different regulatory standards? And in other words, how do you prevent um, a gradual watering down of standards towards the, the standards of, of uh, the grouping that has lower standards in quotes? Uh, because all professional groupings have uh, standards and often quite high standards, but they don't all have the same standards. And in relation to things like conflict of interest, in my view, uh, the lawyers have the strongest standards and offer the greatest protection to the public. And I think that other professional groupings tend to have slightly more relaxed approaches to conflicts of interest. And I think that in the multidisciplinary partnership, there will be pressure, whether intentional or otherwise, to move towards a more relaxed approach to conflict of interest than the stricter one that exists in relation to lawyers, at least in Scotland. No, I personally think that would be a bad thing. Do you think there would be, <coughs> conversely, any opportunities for raising standards for other professionals um, if in the overarching framework um, for, for the bar to be raised, so to speak, as opposed to the, the overall lowering of standards? Oh. It is likely that particularly we spell out the professional principles a bit more than we currently have in the bill. Uh, so it's made clear what the professional principles include, include uh, what I would regard as the more stringent standards, um, that we will require the, the entities to achieve those standards. We will also, I hope, although the bill doesn't fully require us, require all legal services providers who are within alternative business structures or LRSPs to comply with these higher standards. Now, what happens if they don't, this is where we get to the anomalies. If uh, they, uh, they enter into a conflict of interest, the members of a, an LLSB, you police the entity because somebody or several people within the entity have breached the conflict of interest standards. Fine. So you police and discipline the entity with regulator, uh, through a regulatory complaint, and that I understand. Uh, you police the lawyers who are involved against the lawyers' standards. But if there's an accountant involved, the accountant gets disciplined against his or her standard, which is, on conflict of interest, a more relaxed standard, a one that permits more uh, of information barriers than the lawyers' rules do. And with other non-professionals, they may judge to a, a lesser standard or the same standard, but you get what a regulatory mess, and you get what I call a, um, ethical Esperanto. I mean, w what is the ethical code that's going to exist on these beasts? Uh, you know, I hope it's going to be the ethical code of the uh, of the lawyers, but you know, uh, when there's not sort of non-lawyers in there expecting them to attain and to inculcate the ethical standards on conflict of interest it is difficult. <laughs> I'm not saying it's impossible. Okay, thank you. Bill Butler. Thank you, convener. Um, on a matter of ethics, I suppose, Professor, um, in relation to um, regulation of third-party ownership, how satisfied are you that the fitness for involvement test will be effective in excluding criminal elements from investing in or taking control of law firms? It's a real problem, and I think the Law Society is worried about it too. But uh, we, you can list a series of uh, tests, and the SRA in England and Wales have listed a series of tests about people with criminal convictions or recent criminal convictions being excluded from uh, being able to invest and so on. But it's, it's actually quite difficult to do, so it's a risk area that we're opening up. And, and here, um, a close relative or relatives of someone uh, with that kind of uh, criminal background uh, may be given the, the wherewithal to invest? Well, there's all kinds of ways that people will think up to try and avoid the regulations. So I'm with you on that score. I think it is an issue that uh, 
I would have thought, I hope, the Justice Committee will think hard about. But 